because there are now websites that are deliberately set up for fake news to, start, uh, to serve certain agendas. And these are mostly economic agendas. There is an agenda to disparage uh, names of brands. And there is an agenda to share some propaganda which could be false. So I see the fake news as an industry, as a very smart strategic industry which has, be uh, has become a pain for us in the news business. The fundamentals of a news business is based on trust. Uh, foundation, I'm sure you are all communication students, is fact and trust. And the reason why we exist as standard, as nation and citizen is because you trust us. So that is the point of departure for fake news. When trust is questioned, then we begin to question and start to ask what the objective of the news or the information is. So that's how I look at it, and I would emphasize the issue of trust. Trust is the backbone of a media house. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for that perspective. Um, you know, with you all being part of traditional media houses, how do you see the, pre the time pressure of instant news that you can see through the internet or social media how is that impacting the quality of the news in your newsrooms? And do you feel that there is, uh, I mean, Robin mentioned that, that he's seeing on average three incidents of fake news a day. Do you feel that um, sometimes fake news might slip in because of that time pressure related to instant news? Uh, that's a good question. In fact, it made me really think deeply about it. Like I said, the foundation of a media house is trust. Uh, legacy media and what we are now calling new media, there's a process of news verification. But now we are finding that because of the platforms, online is a platform just like broadcast uh, frequencies and the print is a platform. So there is a competition for uh, disseminating news fast and quick. So we're having to ask ourselves and to investigate our gatekeeping process. Because yes, we do get a lot of questionable information, but it is a must that as media houses we check and verify that information. I'll give an example that I went through last year, just before the election, where we got an email uh, to all editors in the newsroom. The account was from Ipsos, Sinovit, and they had this email talking about an opinion poll that had just been released a few days to election time and they had given us a PowerPoint and told us to click to a link that will send to, to the full report. Now, when I looked at the numbers, they had polled around 4 million Kenyans, which if you have studied uh, research, if you're doing a population sample, that's too many. So I immediately saw that and I asked myself some questions and they had 19% in Nairobi and the data was of the eight provinces not uh, the way they normally sample them. So fortunately, I called Ipsos and they said that was not information from them. But if we looked at the URL and the email, it was a .com, not ipsos.co.ke. So we get quite a lot. So in the, in the verification process, we have to check. Sometimes you even get screenshots on WhatsApp, a PDF, and we also some NASA PDF from Parliament, some fake um, registrar PDF, a picture, or we can see on TV, like we have KTN News, we can see a cabinet secretary reading a statement. As he reads, you find a PDF of an alleged statement. So it's really put us on our toes, and it has made us have to call and verify and re-verify. But it's a really, really, um, what I can call like working on eggshells and sometimes you have to use common sense you know if you talk about casualties and all those some numbers are outrageous but that's the experience that we are having day to day of whatsapp especially the pdfs going out on twitter a statement from foreign affairs when you check the logo is different from the date from the stamp 
so you have to call so you are back to the basics of journalism fact checking about truth yeah that's good Robin did you have something to add I think she has uh, summed it all. It's a matter of asking yourself, what is the role of the media? Do you want to be fast with information that has not been verified? Or you want to take your time? And when you're churning out that information, what she spoke about, trust, comes in. If you see something coming from Citizen TV, Twitter page, already you can go out and say this is the real thing, this is what is happening out there without asking a lot of questions. But if we get into that business of rushing with information and getting it wrong, then people also now start questioning our credibility. And we ride on credibility. That's where we make our money. We have to get it right. Thank you. Thank you to add your Just to echo. Um, it, it's very slippery ground, if you ask me. Because the nature of the life of life in the newsroom for a long time has been that the only source of fresh information for many, many decades or centuries, if you like, has been newsrooms in the world. Then you wake up one morning and you are seeing news elsewhere. Yes. The natural instinct many times is that you try to compete that alternative source of that news. So we find that in a lot of newsrooms, not only in Kenya, but in the world today, we have a bunch of journalists trying to compete Facebook, trying to compete Twitter. And many times, <coughs> many of us or many of them don't realize that the, the verification processes that I have to go through before I post something on Twitter or Facebook is totally different from what is required of me as a journalist. So out of that self-imposed uh, race to run against Facebook and to run against Twitter, we end up tripling and we end up falling prey. And those who put together fake news know this. Yeah? Those who are in doing fake news for, for the economic gains out of it or the propaganda value that it offers know I've understood the media very, very, very well. They know that these are how the media is organized. These are the buttons that push them. So they do their homework. By the time they're releasing these snippets of information, many times it finds journalists with their guard down. And that has led to a major question to be asked of journalists today. But who really is a, is a journalist? Is it that person who knows how to take pictures and who knows how to write, who knows how to stand in front of a camera, and who can speak well on telly or radio? Or is it that person who is conducting their profession guided or and governed by a set of values? In short, is journalism defined by the ethics that inform that profession, or is it defined by the skills that we bring to the table? I think the ethics must win in that, in that kind of a, a dichotomy. But it will require that many of us stop what we call event-driven reportage and look at society and have the patience and the courage to wait and verify before going out of information. Thanks. Thank you for that. It's really great. I think what we wanted to hear, I mean, I know Robin had mentioned that uh, about how often he's encountering fake news, but maybe you could give us a little bit more details about the who, what, when, why, and where of fake news. What are you seeing as the most common sources when they're hitting your newsrooms? Um, what are the most common news items that are fake? And do you have any data about how much of your own traffic comes through WhatsApp? Because WhatsApp seems to be uh, a very popular social media platform and yet you have to be a member of the group um, so it's not something like Twitter that you can be an outside user and, and, and see based on the settings. So what are you seeing when you, when you say we're seeing upwards of three 
items a day? Where, where are those coming from? Um, who's sending them to you? And, and how are you encountering that in the newsroom? As I said earlier, and this happened a lot uh, last year during the campaigns and the two presidential general elections. Uh, that's when uh, there was a huge traffic of fake news and uh, we thought that it will end with elections, but it has not because we still get those incidents. In our groups, uh, in our radio stations, I said I talked about 14 radio stations and we have divided them into regions and each has its own uh, WhatsApp account. So we have around 160 correspondents scattered across the country. So that's a huge group. So each group is giving us information. And in there, sometimes they, send, they just send information to the newsroom and they say, as received, confirm. And then you're wondering, we're supposed to confirm. It's them who are supposed to be confirmed because they're on the field. But when they say that, it raises a red flag. Yeah? Because they've not confirmed. So they're saying, check, this might be fake news. But then, as we have seen with what is happening, even today, what is trending with the CA, the Cambridge Analytica, uh, there are people whose main business is to lie to members of the public. And that is our major fight right now in the newsroom. And as I said, that is just about uh, verification. But those incidents are mainly when it comes to political stories and when people just want to be cheeky. Yes. Churchill or Carolyn, do you also have something to say about how you're seeing fake news in your newsrooms? Uh, I think in terms of defining the source, uh, the incidents we've seen seem to come from two main, two main um, uh, areas, if you like. Politics tend to drive a lot of fake news, especially when uh, uh, it's high political season or when there's a back backroom deal making going on and the politicians are trying to manage each other and to create sometimes uh, a crisis even where it doesn't exist to score short-term gains. But we've also seen a lot of it coming from the business direction where uh, competition goes negative and businesses try to take down each other, maybe each other's executives or each other's personalities. So you may find scandals being spread on social media about major industry leaders. It may feel very, very salacious and it will grow legs very fast and go viral. But by the time that fire burns out, somebody's brand or somebody's business is way down. So that tends to be a lot of uh, uh, the drivers of uh, social media as you see it here. But, but I may just want to add that one thing that we see consistently is that the creators of fake news go to great extents to make it attractive. So that when that thing pops up on your face, chances you will believe it unless you have the hesitation to ask yourself, wait a minute, is it really true? And that is beginning to give uh, even uh, mainstream newsrooms a challenge. Even though we have the facts, how do we tell these facts in a, in a manner and in a way that speaks directly to the core audiences that you're trying to reach? That's a challenge that we keep asking ourselves every day. But fake news can just take one picture, put you on Photoshop, and half an hour later, it will tell something that even not a 10,000 word document can deliver. But we come with our mainstream truth and we struggle to turn it in an attractive way that can go viral. That's a big challenge that I think we, are, we have to deal with. Thanks. Uh, what we have seen is uh, a lot of fake news also, um, like they've said, comes from the politicians and, uh, you know, like business. But what I have noticed is if there's some form of event and there's no information. So, for example, I'll give uh, an example that is very close to home. Uh, one of our shareholders, uh, the, uh, the former president, Daniel Moy, 
went to uh, Israel for treatment. There was no information, and somebody killed him. And those types of situations, when there's no information, all it needs is one person to say, I've seen an ambulance from Cabernet Gardens, and all of us start thinking a different direction. So there are certain circumstances that give a breeding ground to rumors, then fake news. Um, a lot of what we call opinion shapers on social media, it can be a radio presenter, it can be me, it can be anybody, it can be either of these gentlemen here, take a question of smoke coming out of here and somebody just spins that truth and other news outlets, smaller news outlets pick the stories and all of a sudden it becomes a story that people are talking about. So it, it comes from all sorts of places, from our news sources, from the politicians themselves. Uh, during the election time, we saw them talking about people who've been shot, but we are not seeing any bodies. Uh, there was a, a, a political rally in Madare, and one of the politicians fell from the stage and broke his leg. The report was like he uh, was that he was shot by a police officer. But when we asked the journalists on the ground, they said. This, this gentleman just fell from the stage. But by the time it was being clarified, the story had gotten legs in, until it became extrajudicial killings. So sometimes that's what happens, and when credible sources like the police don't give information, they go mute. People draw conclusion, and since they are looking at the media and we are not giving them a report from this police spokesman, they assume that that uh, rumor is true. So yes, we are finding ourselves in a very tight corner where if the source who is supposed to clarify is not talking, the audience is demanding what is it, the fact, we are in the center, then if we don't talk, you accuse us of being gagged. Yet we've called the source and they have not spoken. So it's, it's a very, very delicate situation that uh, we are finding ourselves, especially in, in, in this, what I call the new media era. So on that example that you just raised with, with President Moy, because that's actually part, if you look at our online quiz that uh, that Kristen introduced in the beginning at uh, yali.state.gov uh, had backslash checks, there is an online quiz and that's one of the questions about uh, President Moy and whether you would forward that if you got that news on your WhatsApp. Um, I mean, at what point do you see a rumor becoming fake news? When is it just a rumor, and when does it become so big? Is it is it uh, the online influencers that you mentioned, or is it when a legitimate news source, traditional media, picks up the rumor that it becomes fake news? Where is that line of definition in your in your opinions? Anyway, since I have the mic, I can start and then I pass it on. I think where we are at now, anything is a rumor. Uh, even if I see a Reuters, uh, we had an example of Mugabe resigning. He was resigning, he was not resigning, and we were following the international media. He did not resign. Then there was uh, Jacob Zuma. We, we, we reported his resigning because we saw, uh, we got some reports off the wires that he's resigned, he stepped down. So now we are, ask, we, are, we are going slow on reporting until we get the actual information. So for, for me, everything is a rumor until verified. Even if I see it on, you know, on a reporter's page and have to cross-check. Because like I said when I started, we are in the business of trust. And if trust is broken, we are in a very complex situation with our audience. We have a rider in our newsroom, and uh, we say, if you have not heard it from us, consider it has not happened. Because we go that uh, extent to confirm and verify information. Uh, but it's a big problem uh, where people just take anything on the social media, on these online platforms and they take
take it as the real thing that is happening to the ground. Yesterday we had an incident uh, where one of our competition had a story about uh, Tiger Woods that had ordered uh, 157 paternity tests. I don't know if anybody here saw that. And uh, it was a very, if, if for people who love golf and sports, that's a big story. So I tasked one of my people to go and get the story. What happens, uh, we have our own wire uh, services where we get our information because definitely we don't have a correspondent where that incident happened in the U.S. And checking all the sites, we could not get that story. Yeah, we even had to call Reuters to confirm for us, and they say they didn't have anything of that sort. So it, it's a real threat uh, in the newsroom. When does the rumor become fake news? Uh, <clears throat> from where I see it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. When somebody comes out to own that rumor, and that rumor is deliberately not true, then it becomes fake news. So there was a rumor about former President Moi until some website somewhere purported to do a story about it deliberately. Then that became fake news. Sometimes we have information flying that everybody's trying to check. But for as long as it's still, there's still just a whiff, nobody's really pushing it out. I don't think it meets the threshold to be called fake news. And uh, that is just human nature. When there are those gaps, we'll try to seek out and find out what really is the truth. But the minute somebody goes in to, to own it, and many times they own it for a variety of reasons, then uh, I guess the threshold is met. Okay, sounds great. I just have one, sort of, one more set of questions to ask, and then I think we'll probably open it up to the audience for them to ask their own questions. But, um, so you've all mentioned that you've seen fake news, that it's out there. Um, how are you combating it? Is, it? is it just through this verification processes that you have, or your editorial checks that you have? Um, how do you devote staff time to particularly searching down these rumors? Or are you also looking for the fake news sites that maybe look similar to your own, but maybe be a fake site? Um, just sort of interested in, in how you're looking at it from an institutional perspective, and not just as an in, not just as an individual, but how is your uh, company or institution addressing this through? Or do you find that you're devoting more people than maybe ten years ago, or? before social media really took off? Uh, <clears throat> At the Nation, I've defined three main areas. The first one is fairly straightforward. Acting to take down anybody who is mis misrepresenting a Nation asset. <clears throat> so if you build a website and you want to pass it off as a Nation website, we'll do our best. One, to make the public aware that that's not our site, but also to make sure that you are not accessible to the public in situations where we can. The second thing is that recognizing that the landscape, the news landscape has changed and, uh, and that fake news is so perverse. We are moving to also change the kind of stories we do by, for instance, introducing fact-checking on a fairly consistent basis. Yeah? So that not only do we tell the world what happened, or who said what, or who did what, we also inject our own tech on how true what they said, or what they did, is. Uh, and that's, that's it. we found that important, because as time went by, we realized that you get to a point where even usually reliable news sources begin to manipulate you, begin to become sources of fake news, sometimes even sources in government. 
And that's just the reality that we have to deal with. So sometimes, by virtue of their positions, you must tell the world what they're saying. But we feel we've taken it as our duty to also remind people where they are misrepresenting facts to bring out fairly clearly. The third main intervention that you're trying to make is just to find ways to drive ethical practice of journalism. Push our journalists to go back to the core ethics of the profession. Number one, you must be accountable for the information that you put in your reportage. It must be something that you have yourself gone out and confirmed. <clears throat> and therefore we, we take very mean uh, attention to, for instance, uh, those who sometimes, for whatever reason, might choose to plagiarize other people's work. Because when you plagiarize somebody else's work, basically, you haven't had the chance to verify these facts for yourself. And you take them and pass them as your own. It's a cardinal offense in journalism, and we don't entertain it, because it becomes a source of fake news. If you come to, to us and say that I'm reporting it because so-and-so had reported it, it's a story that was taken carried by so-and-so, that's never enough. That can only be a tip. The second bit of it is that, is that of that last third point, is just that we're just pushing to fidelity to professionalism. On your beat, understand your story, know the sources in that beat, so that when something happens, however dramatic it might be, you have verifiable sources available to you to confirm that indeed it's true. That way, we are able over time to, in a fairly short time, uh, be able to decide whether an air breaking story is as, 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 uh, as legitimacy or not. Thank you. Um, as you said, we are also empowering our teams through training and uh, just to ensure that they know when to raise the red flag, when news, uh, when the fake news crops up. So it's about uh, the right personnel for the right job. Before, I think last year we had a very small uh, online department but we have increased uh, manpower and there are a lot of uh, new posts coming up so for those who want to practice journalism I think that is an area you need to look. It's very dynamic and uh, it's uh, growing by the day. Again, if, uh, to use uh, the fact checkers like the Africa check uh, which are out there and uh, you can be able to run through your stories and find out whether this information is uh, credible uh, but then again you get to ask yourself before you decide whether you want to debunk all the fake news that is coming in because sometimes when you repeat uh, fake news the people will still it like uh, it's the real thing that happened. So we also discourage a lot of just debunking news from uh, all quarters. But when something is big, we go with that. The one for more, and you can be able to follow it up and not push it like you're debunking a fake story. So you're reporting on what is happening in the state of Moy. So we can say on that fake news is not that bad. Sometimes uh, it gets us from our comfort in the newsroom we pursue some of these stories. From the standard group, um, of course now we've been forced to rethink and relook our gatekeeping, the levels of gatekeeping uh, when the story comes, who has to check and so on and so forth. Of course there's the issue of training and insisting that uh, accuracy is key. Uh, but from where I sit as uh, a digital department, the beauty of running online platforms is you can see data from the back end. And, you know, if you see certain types of keywords picking up, because from the end you can see shares, we measure shares, I'm able to see the most shared tweets, like the most read and what percentage of the article has been read and so on and so forth. 
and Google Trends is able to tell you what people are searching. So, for example, one, one, one of the things we are now doing is re actually writing about the fake news. For example, last year there was a circulated KCSC certificate of Uhuru Kenyatta. How many saw it? And he had E grades and D grades. But it needed someone who schooled in the, in the 70s to actually confirm that there was no KCC then. But we were seeing a lot of Uhuru Kenyatta searches. So we asked ourselves, what, how do we turn around this story? And we did a story about 10, 10 things that prove that this is not Uhuru Kenyatta's KCC certificate. The name of the school, there was no KCC, the person who signed. So we took the fake certificate and we drew arrows and we did a story about it. But that took from us watching the search, the search trends. So we are now seeing where we also become like uh, CA, Cambridge Analytica, where we can actually trace your footprints online and actually see what you're reading. Secondly, we are now able to put codes on our links and I'm able to tell how many stories or which stories are being shared most on WhatsApp. So that tells us something about audience engagement of news. So analytics, training, the other thing we are doing is reporting these fake accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and just ensuring that we are in constant communication with Google with Facebook because we've been, uh, as, as one of the bands KTN has and Standard has fallen victim of uh, fake Twitter accounts where someone is running an account and sharing pictures and even sharing fake videos, you know, taking a video and putting, it's very easy uh, if you're you have the right tools for me to pick up a video and put the logo of the embassy and claim it's a press conference that was done and use it uh, to share it on a fake Twitter account. So now with technology, you're actually able to trace where the account was registered, if it's a website, if the website was registered locally and put resources into bringing down those accounts. It takes a long time. Uh, but of course, uh, those are now the, some of the things we are having to wake up to. Because like I insist, we're in the business of trust. And if that is compromised, we are talking about our businesses going down, so to speak. Thank you. Great, because you actually answered what my next question was. was how much work do you do with Google or Facebook or Twitter to identify sites? But. Um, what are the laws in Kenya that govern fake news? And do you feel that they're strong enough or that the system is strong enough for the law to be an effective tool? Or do you feel that just um, taking down the site or having um, Twitter remove the account is enough? Uh, or can you actually find the person who's behind it where they registered that account and actually bring that person um, through the court system in Kenya. Churchill, Shula, all the hard questions. <laughs> that was a nice way to pass it off. Uh, I don't think it's news that the law is always late. Yeah, the law is always late because it takes the way legislation happens that going through that iteration process. It's, it's months down the road before it becomes um, it becomes law. The nature of this digital space is that things are moving so 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 fast, so much so that by the time you understand the the existing reality and develop policies around it and translate those policies into law, the issues you are trying to address would have morphed into something completely different. So. While there must be some law, the answer is not entirely in the law. I think a lot will have to do with the, uh, media literacy amongst audiences, just yeah, so that all of us can know that as that clip comes to you on WhatsApp, as you see that scintillating photo 
on Facebook or wherever else you see it, that you have that questioning mind to ask yourself, is this really true? Yeah. But the bigger issue really for us is ourselves, even those of us sitting here. Yeah. Friends of mine who follow football usually are interesting people to watch. Some of them f support Arsenal, others support Manu, and they really hate each other. They really hate each other. So that whenever the Arsenal guys hear a bad thing about Manu, they straight away believe it and they spread it. And vice versa. I see those behaviors also amongst our tribes. I see that behavior amongst our politics. And when it comes to that, it doesn't matter how professional or well-schooled I am. I'll get that clip and spread it. And sometime I had it under the fact that it's just a joke I'm passing along. And the more those clips align to my own world view, the higher the chances that I will spread it. It's something that researchers have come to call confirmation bias. That if the piece of fake news aligns to your own beliefs and your own thinking, that many times you'll pick it and spread it to all the groups you are in. So even as you can sit here and speak a lot of English about how those who create fake news are bad, the only reason those fake news gets life is because all of us are willing to participate in that, in spreading it. And even those of us who are journalists, we go into the newsroom and say, oh, we are very objective, we are very professional. But if a story comes that is hitting at the party that at the, uh, deep inside my heart I'm against, chances I'll pass that story much quicker and with less questioning than if it was a story that was doing the, other, the opposite. And that really is one source of power that enables fake news to spread. And I wonder how do we address that using law? I think that the, the bigger questions may have to throw at it bigger than the law. Did I answer it well? Yes, <laughs> but I can add something. <laughs> um, we have the Kika lawyer, the Kenya Information Communications Act, which sometimes the government can use to deal uh, with fake news. But uh, in Kenya, I'd say we love to come up with laws whenever we face challenges. Sometimes that can be dealt with by the sector itself. Maybe the media industry itself and the government need to sit down and agree on how to face uh, fake news rather than just coming with laws. Because as Churchill has said, uh, the digital sphere is evolving too fast. So sometimes we pass that law and we know the processes uh, that it takes to pass a new law. Before that, things will have really changed. So th the law will uh, be doing something, will be doing catch up, and that will not uh, help a lot. And then there's also that fear that uh, in the process of coming up with new laws, the government will always try and come up with things that will uh, compromise uh, the media freedoms. So we have to be very careful and not, not only just to think about uh, laws because sometimes they can be used against the media and against uh, uh, the free flow of information. Uh, to be honest, I don't think you can control the internet if I were to look at it like that because even the people who operate uh, fake news are faceless. So for me to go to court, I must have somebody to accuse. And yes, we have the label, the libel and the defamation laws, yes, which apply to mainstream media. But sometimes you find that it's a funny website that has taken your company logo. It is non-existent, you can't trace. So the only thing you can do is, of course, write to Google and complain. But Google is not based here. So even if I'm, I'm you know, and those are the questions we are now seeing uh, being asked in the U.S., where they had even to face, um, you know, answer 
how they are able to promote certain content on these platforms. The world is now realizing that we have this monster that we can't control that is borderless. So I think it's an opportune time for us now to start rethinking the laws locally and maybe globally and some of the global players, how do we interact with them? What do they do with our own data? Uh, Apple has a lot of our information. Google has and you allow them to take your information. And if somebody takes that information and uses that network to spread fake news, where do you go to? If you're a brand, for example, brands have suffered fake news. So I think it's more of a local problem, international problem that we need to start asking ourselves uh, as organizations, perhaps having to train our staff about uh, those kinds of issues. We have the media council sitting down and saying as media brands in this country, what role should we play as far as, um, as uh, fake news is concerned? What are the self-regulation that people can now come and complain about this type of content and so on and so forth? But I think it's going to get worse as we go on, as we have all these mobile devices, and you know, as we consume so much information that is generated, user generated by all sorts of kinds of people, we even have now the Al Qaeda who have their own information networks. So, is it true when they confirm that they are responsible for this attack? Is it not true? Do we report it? So, it's it's a bit of a very interesting time we are living in. And all I would say is the internet. We should ask ourselves, what controls should we put on the internet? Because before the internet, if something was not reported on radio, it was not true. But now I can stand up and tweet and say something. And since I'm associated with a media brand, there is some quote-unquote half-truth. We're having bloggers who are in the business of tarnishing people's reputations. We're having bloggers who are now saying they have uh, telegram groups for you to get the latest information. And one of the things I've noted is gossip is a growing industry world over. Look at sports. All the major sites in the world have gossip sections. So feeding off the internet. I look at data. You guys love a lot of gossip. So I think I'll throw that to the audience and maybe one of you who will ask that maybe can answer me that question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sounds good. Well, if the laws are, are lagging behind and the problem is going to only get worse, but you come back to maybe the answer being in the media literacy of the audience, do you just have um, a couple uh, online tools that you use to check the veracity of a photo or a video or something that you can maybe share with us? And, and we'll make that be the last question that I ask, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So just if you have uh, some, I, I know Roman mentioned Africa Check. That's one of our partners in our um, campaign uh, with Stop, Reflect, Verify, but if you have another sort of online tool that you can share with the audience, um, that might help us with the media literacy and the audience aspect. Okay, I'll answer yes, shortly. I think one of the things that I encourage uh, people in the newsroom is something called image reverse search. So you go online on Google, there's a, a place where you can load and verify that image, and it gives you all the information about that image. So if it's about some dead bodies and it's claimed that they, these are people killed in Kisumu, if you search it, we had one last year about an accident in Tanzania, which fortunately was used by lots of media people and even being shared on WhatsApp about police killing people. But if you did a reverse image search, you'd find out that this was an accident that happened in Tanzania and school children died. So even on your own mobile phone, if you get an image, please just do a reverse search. And if you're in the group, you're able to correct that information. The other thing is, of course, URL verification. Um, 
know the media house the main ones our url that's your the ke and so on and so forth then you're able to quickly check because sometimes it comes with a logo for either nation or citizen or standard once you see the logo imagine you don't even check check the url the other one is we have something called guidelines of checking a video running it on youtube and confirming the authenticity nigerian media is very notorious for uh, publishing content that especially videos so i tell people you must be very very careful with videos the other thing you can do is take grab screenshots of the video and run it on the reverse image then it will show you whether the person who created the video actually picked random images to create the video and of course the fact checker we have that but also the, the full proof is to actually call the source and confirm uh, that's at least what we use um, and of course common sense yeah I think I'll throw this to the audience go back and research and there's a lot of that uh, online about the fact checks yeah I think that is something that you should do immediately you live here but again is also check with other sources don't just rely on one source so if it's been reported by one organization or media house and you have your own questions ask yourself what are, why is this story not on the other platforms you've done a very good job of it yeah. sir. <laughs> okay well i think we should probably open it up to questions from the audience since i i got to ask all of the questions uh, Kristen, you have a microphone? I do. Okay, Kristen has a microphone. If you want to raise your hand and just uh, say your name and if you're a student, where you're studying and, uh, and, and who you want your question to go to, the whole panel or an individual. Thank you. Hello. But remember the house rule, yeah? All the hard questions go to Churchill. <laughs> um, my name is Aurelia Thiambo. I'm a student at University of Nairobi and also a volunteer at development goals um, I have more to one comment and one question um, the first comment is um, I've seen that you've just re um, tackled this topic on the issue of mostly political affairs but fake news runs also in the job postings advertisements and stuff like that like recently there was a fake advert of census the baby conducting census in kenya that it has job openings call for openings for people to come and apply and re later we found out that it was fake um so you've not addressed that topic in depth because you find that maybe if you post a job opening I post all my information, even confidential ones on that, only to later realize that maybe it's fake. So maybe this is a con scheme, trying to gather my information. And then on the second question, is there a similarity between fake news and con schemes? What is the benefit? Because if I run a story on social media that is fake, what, what will I gain for it apart from, I'm trying to figure that out. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can start with your last question and I think we addressed that uh, we said sometimes people don't just want to make a profit when they are pushing fake news some of them just want to be cheeky and there are a lot of people like that yeah? they just want to put information that uh, will be alarmist and then they will sit back and be very happy to see the, uh, a whole country confused just because of their post. And you know a lot of people, and maybe some are here. <laughs> yeah. So it's not normally for profit reason that people are pushing uh, fake news. There's also the propaganda bit, and we discussed about that. About job openings, fake news, as Churchill said, is a huge industry. We've just focused on news because we thought that was the brief. Uh, we have uh, fake news when it comes to job openings, entertainment, yeah, 
because of uh, competition within the artists. Yeah? We have the land companies that are also big and pushing their own agenda. So fake news is so huge that we've just focused on one aspect. Do we have another exclusive story maybe and then my second question is uh, you said sometimes and it, I think it's Caroline I think she said um, some of these things happen because there's a gap there's a gap in, um, in in information and then maybe the media house or whoever is in charge try to call the source and the source didn't say anything so uh, why why don't media houses just report and say uh, the source didn't talk. He said, "Okay, keep it quiet. I'm just saying because we, 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 are, we, are, we, we are still in dark, in darkness. So what could happen? Instead of keeping people in the dark and uh, creating this room for fake news to flourish. Thank you. Let me start because I discussed uh, exclusive news. What I meant was... Uh, check with other sources. This is mainly to do with uh, blogs. Because uh, traditional media houses or the legacy media is not about fake news. And I don't see Churchill just pushing uh, fake news in nation. Oh, my friend Caro in standard. So it's mainly to do with blogs. And there are a lot of those blogs out there. And sometimes you, you consume your information from the blogs. So it's up to you to ask yourself, yes, we know that they are exclusive stories. When the traditional media has a big exclusive story, they will even label it exclusive. But these other sources, yeah, there is no way that they will be the only ones with that information. And right now, if they have that information, within 10 minutes, somebody else will have picked it. So after 30 minutes, nobody is picking up that story and you still want to believe that that is not fake news who won't you uh, when the source doesn't speak I think we do report that they don't speak uh, I'll give you a live example that happened to us that was distorted until it became something very ugly uh, we ran a story about Kenya power and the bills the power bills so the story was, it was an investigative, it, is, it was an investigative story uh, by our TV journalists. We reached out to Kenya Power. They refused to talk. They refused. We chased until we said, fine, in the story we are going to say that they were not able to reach us. So the story was pa packaged and we started promoting it on social media. Then when the officials saw that were promoting the story. Of course, they called the owners of the company and they said, you know, you guys, there's something big you, you want to expose. Then we said, but we called the CEO and he was not available. Lo and behold, that same afternoon, he availed himself for an interview. So now what happened is we had to tell audiences that we can't run the story in the evening. You know what happened? We were called... Gideri Media, you've been gagged. So I found myself in a situation, do we start explaining to the audience that this is what happened to these Kenya Power people? Because sometimes there's some information that is a bit hard to explain. But the story did run, but that is what happened. Sometimes they totally refuse until when they realize uh, that there are gaps they now come back. When the story has run, they start saying they were misquoted or it was wrong information, yet you try to reach the, 
the, the person they were not available and anyway good journalism means giving all sides of the story any editor you do a report they'll ask you where's the other side so if your editor passes off your report with one side then there's a issue of professionalism in the whole chain and that's why media houses have editors sub editors copy editors revise editors they are supposed to pick that out and of course when information is in the interest of the public i'm supposed to call and say i reached to you and i'm supposed to explain to you i'm supposed to go to on air in 2 minutes in 10 minutes and so on and so forth and that's why we have spokes people there giving a statement and sometimes um saying we'll get back to you it's still a comment but i think we do say and um yeah and let's say the rest have something to add i can add to that do you want me to add to that i don't know if this one is going to work uh and as i'm the embassy press attache or spokesperson i can confirm that we do sometimes don't have a comment and that does get reported that the embassy had no comment and then it has my name next to it <laughs> so that does happen here maybe for the benefit of those who are keen to to get into newsroom so all i can add to that is that <coughs> in times gone by good journalism schools used to teach about right of reply that if you're doing a story about me then you must get my comment but fiona and others whom we look for for comments have gotten smart so if the story is not particularly a story they want to run they become unavailable for comment so today good journalism schools teach about opportunity to reply not right to reply so my duty as a journalist is to make sure i give you ample time to get your response through if you choose not to take it then i, I owe my audiences an explanation that i did 1 2 3 4 5 things to provide that opportunity but the source chose not to give a response and leave it at that how shall have done my work so fiona now we know <laughs> My name is Salome. Uh, Ray um, I, I, I think uh, the reality is that uh, fake news is there, and we, the, the, the question is not um, whether we allow them, but I think the question should be how do we deal with it? Because I, I see it as a, a healthy competition, especially to the media houses, because sometimes it becomes our source of our stories. and then we we verify but i uh, i would just want to ask about speed because sometimes when it's a uh, live coverage or maybe sometimes it's live interviews it's in your station you've invited someone you've briefed them but in the middle of the 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 show someone says something that as a station you cannot stand for so um how will be the speed how how, how do you like sometimes maybe the director is telling this person please cut that person out and they're too high you can cut them out so um how do we come to balance that so that uh, we, that we don't appear that we still have some values as journalists we we just let them and then we know how to you know like um uh, we will know how to fix this out so how about the speed especially on breaking news sometimes to know that this is the truth but because someone has it spoken and um we keep on we have those screens we have ktm we have ntv citizen and we looking at if that other media is reporting it so at what, what point do we place our stand and put our you know like feet down thank you there you go um so that it doesn't become an RMS affair. Uh, we'll make sure Robin doesn't respond to this. <laughs> uh, it's really simple from where I sit. Whose studio is that? Whose station is that? And therefore, who is running that show? That's the person who manages 
what goes out. Of course, you don't have to um, deny. What's that problem? You don't have to deny whoever the interviewee a chance to say have their say. But it behoves us then to make sure that the person hosting that show, the person conducting that interview, is sufficiently informed to know when this interviewee goes out of the line and is capable to, to one, raise it, point it out, even if it's on air, so that the audiences are clear that what, whatever it is that may have, might have been said has crossed the line in one way or another. The second bit of it is what support do we provide that individual? even as they are on air. In the, back, in the back room, there could be some researchers who are actively checking these facts. And before the show is over, your presenter should be able to come back in and just make sure that we leave the audience at a place where they're fully informed. Insofar as breaking news goes, sometimes some pieces of information that is, is terribly important. So it might be that your rivals have been able to confirm that story and are running with it, but you haven't. At some point, you have to come through and say, uh, we have reports that the following has happened. We are working to check it. Yes? But that is, that is agreeable. The only thing you can do is that you, is <coughs> you can't pick so-and-so story and run it as yours, because then it might just come in with a whole host of errors, which you can't account for. Uh, just to add a bit, uh, because we run a 24-hour news station, it's very difficult and very hard. But if you're in broadcasting, you know, um, if you have what we call a guest who you might say certain things, there's a delay that you put for a few seconds. So that delay is what, if you're the director or the producer of that program, you have to be very alert so that if the person says something, you immediately uh, s switch it off because you have like a five, seven. During the election time, we actually took that to advantage because you'd be in a political rally and you're listening and you can tell that this statement is wrong, so you immediately get it off, off air. That's uh, internally some responsibility that uh, I think media managers need to have because this live broadcast can be very dangerous and volatile. That said, I think we are all watching the NASA rallies on Facebook Live. So if Citizen NASA show me nation and KTN, I'll go to Facebook Live. When we were switched off, we watched the rally on. Facebook Live. We all sat and watched it and we're wondering who's the broadcaster now. So like I said, this internet is going to be a very, very big monster because right now Mark Zuckerberg is the biggest broadcaster on this planet. Thank you. Well, I, I want to close there. Uh, we will have some time to do some mingling uh, at the end. And I know Kristen wants to show you the video that we finally have sound for. But let me just stop and...